The Lord has something special for us. Are you ready? God has a word in the house. I believe the Lord has, has given us something extremely special today. And um, I'm going to make the most in my capacity to really convey the way that he just gave it to me. Are you ready for that? I'm just a man like you. So if you cannot give it better, keep it. And if you can give it better, tell me about it. <laughs> Amen. Coming out of the bat, under the title, I believe that God has for us, is build the edge. And we're going to come out of Proverbs. Build the edge out of Proverbs 27. And I'm going to do the New King James Version for us. Is that okay with you guys? That's too old school? No. Shall we stand for the reading of the word? What do you think? Doing a little bit of squads in there? Getting a little bit of the body moving? Yeah. Proverbs 27, 17 says in the New King James Version, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And if we follow up with Luke 17, 1 to 4 in the NIV Version says, Jesus said to these disciples, Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to throw into the sea, to be thrown into the sea with a milestone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke him. And if they repent, forgive him. And verse 4 finishes saying, even if they sin against you seven times, in a day, what a patience. And seven times they come back to you saying, I repent. You must forgive him. And to that they said, Lord, increase our faith. Father, thank you for your word. And we ask, Lord, that you will multiply in us. Father, your virtue. Father, your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Get comfortable. Get comfortable. Yeah. So context of this is, is easy. Proverbs is a foundational stone for what we heard Jesus say to the, his disciples. So we're going to start with that. Is that okay? So we go chronologically. Yeah. So this specific proverb was written by Solomon, King David's son. And Solomon was actually born out of, if not the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes that David did against God. You and me commit mistakes all day, but they're, they're, sometimes they're not that big. Solomon was born out of one of the biggest mistakes David made. Sometimes we actually ponder upon the things that we have done, even during the week, and we say, what if I wouldn't have done that? But in this moment, we have a man in front of us that didn't have the luxury of being like that. You and me ponder and try to fix I mean, I remember, and this it might be very strange for some of you guys, but bear with me. Maybe some of you guys that had bigger brothers or were younger brothers will relate. Or some of you guys that were a bit more naughty in school. I remember I would, I would do something at school, right? And, um, and I ended up in the office every day at least four times out of five classes. You know what I mean? The other one, I missed it because I was in the office because in between classes. <laughs> <laughs> and at some points, I was actually suspended for like a week, two weeks, because I had mounted it up. It has not changed that much today. You know, it is what it is. I've got builders in specific ways for a specific task, making problems. Um, and <laughs> or actually pointing at them. Anyways, um, today I point more at them than make them, so it is what it is. But one of the things that I used to um, think about until God stopped me one day, it was what if. And I was hosted to just the what if of God in my life and then the in-between. I don't know if it has happened to you that you sometimes ponder about a situation that you didn't take the best decision and you start thinking. Maybe that, that's me. I know that you guys are like super settled in life and you have no doubts of your character and you still think that you're perfect. It's okay. But there's some of us in this room that are not like that. So give us some space. Yeah, is that okay? Can we breathe? Ah, yes. So I used to think a lot about the what if. And the what if became an addiction in my life. And 
sooner that I actually kind of was able to pick it up, I was, I was always bound before my actions were wrong to the what if. Before my actions, even the good ones, all my actions were bound to the what if. So I started having fear to the future. For the ones that know me, that's kind of like a surreal thought out of me. But since I was young, I started thinking about what if so strongly that I would create scenarios. And based on what I would think, I can conjure in my mind with my wisdom or experience because experience has a lot to do with what we're going to talk today. I was, I was taking decisions that were way more transcendental that I had in means to take. So when we are finding ourselves in this story, I think of us maybe from the point of view of Solomon. Maybe Solomon didn't wake up one day and say, I was, you know, I was born out of the biggest mistake of the most famous king the earth has seen. But this is the reality. David committed one of the biggest mistakes of his life, and out of that, Solomon's mom married David. And from there, Solomon was born. Genetics, it happens. That's pure science right there. Well, that's not the point. Don't get distracted. So this comes out, this moment comes out of a man. This proverb comes out of a man. This proverb that says, you know what? Iron sharpens iron. And you think, okay, that's obvious. But then he enlarges it. And he brings it down home in a place that we all can reach. And he says, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. To be a friend of someone means you're near. You know, at least, well, at least back in the day. You know, like nowadays you have friends that you even don't know. Someone asks you for friendship, you know, and you just like, yeah, accept, that's it. And that's your friend. But in real life, that's not real. A friend knows how you smell. They know that specific shape of your eyes when you're happy or you're excited. They're the ones that stop you and say, are you okay? And you feel completely unarmed, disarmed, and you don't know even how to fake it. See, that's a friend in the real life, not the one that gives you a, like a thumbs up in, in a specific picture that you photoshopped to hell and back and played that you were Picasso with the little app in your little phone. See, a friend knows your eyes. The Bible says, you know, that the, the, the windows, the windows to our soul are in our eyes, in our senses, right? So a friend knows how you look when you look like you look. They know it. It's like when you see Courtney at the beginning of worship, you know. She's going to become helicopter lady right then and there. Like she's going to go crazy. And you know that when Courtney is in the corner with the tea, Courtney had a different week. Talk to me. Don't leave Corny alone, yeah? Because you know how you are. You know when you fake it, and you're faking the funk most days. You don't leave Corny alone or me. Because we're like, I mean, I expose myself, and I expose Corny for the, the <laughs> proliferance of everyone. But right now, if we're honest, we're not leaving Solomon alone on this ship. Solomon was talking about something that is very real. He's saying, you know what, iron sharpens iron. And he's actually kind of reflecting that on how we walk with one another. And nowadays, we're living in the most offended generation scenario ever in history. Politicians are offended with one another. Dogs are offended with one another. And everything in between. It is what it is. So if we stop there... We might get so sidetracked and distracted that we, take, that we don't take it home. We don't take it to our heart. We don't take it to our spirit. We don't take it to our mind and, and how we think and how we feel and how we re relate to the Holy Spirit. But that's our portion for today. Are you ready? So then Jesus comes in. So I want to marry that foundation, Proverbs 27, that says, you know, a man sharpens iron. And, you know, in so such a man sharpens the countenance of a friend. And Jesus is coming and he's walking with the disciples and he's explaining essentially what is sin and actually faith and our duty. 
So he talks to the disciples out of the blue because probably they were having a couple of corners cut around in their relationships. I mean, don't, don't take it lightly. At that moment, everyone had left their jobs, their reputations, their families, some their wives. And Jesus is that mad man that is just making everyone that couldn't see, see. And those that couldn't walk for ages, 37, 38, give it away. Those were walking. And you're walking with this man, but you have no clue what you're doing. Just like you and me in life. We're trying to look like we're professionals at us. But all of us are discovering day in and day out what we have to share with that day. I don't know if it has been your story, but for many moments it has been mine. I've gone to bed saying, Lord, I gave everything I had. If you want me to have more for tomorrow, I don't know how you're going to make it because I don't sleep much. But you have a few hours to give it up. Because I don't know what I'm giving. I have nothing left. If you take me home now, I'm happy. Because I would say I gave it all. I don't know if that's your story, but probably was some nights the life of the disciples. Just give and take. I know that our world is way more Western now. So it was more polished. And it has more lights like those. And it says that Jesus said to the disciples, things that cause people to stumble. Another version says the things that cause people to sin. And what is sin? It has a bad rep, but a worse record. Sin is not doing something that everyone like. <gasps> Sin is doing not what you know is right. So then you have to take your whole back, your whole life back and think, what are the things that I didn't do what I knew was right? That's a bigger list. Not a good Sunday sermon. But a lot more complete and comprehensive about your soul and the state of your mind and everything you believe. And Solomon is telling to tell us that we need a friend. But this is not about Facebook or Metaverse or whatever we call it nowadays. This is about Jesus teaching. And when someone teaches, it's because they have comprehensive information and experience. And they want to pass it on so we are able to develop the way that we think with the knowledge of who is giving it. That already was paying your tube ticket, that's it. Jesus is the context. Paying for our, our, our tube, uh, our ground. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I know you don't like it, but don't worry about it. We're going to learn. And Jesus is teaching, is teaching actually the people, what is it not to do what is right? And Jesus is coming with this so the disciples learn because they have been humbled. They have been humbled by, by the remarks of Jesus. They say, hey, mate, if someone does this to you, that and the other, one, two, three, seven times, even if they, they, even if they have asked and they continue doing it, forgive. Seven times seven. And Jesus, Jesus didn't give him any good news. You know, like, like religious people say, like, yeah, I will do that. It's like the people of Israel when they received the Ten Commandments. It's like, yeah, we will do those. And then they felt flat-faced, you know, like straight away. And how many times we actually hear things that are good in our minds, but they don't translate to actions and freedom during our daily. And as Christians, I think that's the biggest gap that we have. And probably the, the, the source of the biggest fr fr frustrations that we have. That our character sometimes doesn't go to church with us. We say it, we think it, but at the same time, we don't act on it. And we have that distance. It's like the distance between your heart and your mind. It's that distance that we call neck most days. But the reality of it is that most of us are not connected with what we think, think and feel most days. And our faith suffers the same predicament, suffers the same challenge, day in and day out. And our frustration, like Paul would say, you know, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. What a wreck am I? All of us have to comply with that concept. Have to say, hey, you know what, count me in, I'm one of those. I'm a wreck. But the wounds that we have, if they become scars, they will heal others. And we're going to go into that in a second. Jesus is saying, they will come. 
wounds, offenses, things that you didn't like will come. But then we just turn the page and we say, Solomon say, hey, we're supposed to challenge or sharpen each other into the daily, into what God is, into his character. So what is it that I can take from moments like this? Thank you for asking. Don't worry about it. We're going to say in a minute. So the di disciples are being humbled, but they also are getting acquainted with the reality and they're asking for faith. So forgiveness and faith have a lot to do with one another. Maybe take that into your week. Father, can you teach me what the heck faith and forgiveness have to do with one another? It takes faith to trust on someone that has failed you. It takes faith to believe in someone that has not reached your standard or your expectations. It takes faith. When you call the company that provides you mobile service and they say, we're going to fix this. What is the first thing that comes into your mind? Are you? <laughs> when you go into the mechanic and you pick your car and they say, yeah, it's fixed. You're always expecting a bill. Is it? Like once I actually picked the car and the car died on the way out of the, of the garage. I didn't pay extra. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm, I'm that big mouthed, you know. But that's life as well. I used to work in a hospital. I worked in Subway. I've been delivering newspapers. I've tattooed people. I had to work in construction. I have worked with plumbing. I have worked with ceiling roofs. I've worked in everything you want to imagine. I even worked with you. And <laughs> wow, I can get worse than that. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's my CV right there in a minute. <laughs> and um, so many times, you know, we, we work with things in life. And it happened to me a lot in the hospital, you know, that the people will go out on a Tuesday. They will be back on a Friday. They were not fixed. And sometimes we walk into the word of God. We go into moments of like this. And we walk with such expectations but no commitment that sometimes we can walk into the doctors. We can walk into the hospital and walk out feeling hot, feeling awesome. Because we got a word that got into our senses, but didn't get into our spirit because our expectations were not meeting God. They were expecting someone to tell me what to fix. And I wanted to do it in my own strengths. But I have to rely, and that's the Bible. I have to rely on someone else. Jesus came just to explain to us what's to be a brother or a sister. What is it to be for one another? And Jesus wanted to say, hey, it is bound to happen. Things are going to go, hey, oh, they're going to go against the wall. You're not going to like one another every day. <laughs> but still, I am with you. Yes or no? I know that's not for you, but you can touch your neighbor and say, hey, that's for you. I know. Don't worry about it. I got you. So iron sharpens iron, and this is our context. So and, and we, if we look at the actual nature of iron sharpening iron, it, we talk about the chemistry of that. And I was talking with a group of, of friends the other day about this. We were talking about how the chemistry of, of iron and iron actually works. And we're talking about furnace and we're talking about heat and we're talking about everything that it, it entails, right? And as I was, I was preparing for this moment and that moment with my friends, you know, I mean, I was, I was thinking the different types of alloys and the different people that we gather. If we go into the Bible, we can go into moments like Jesus. He was meeting in a house of Peter and, and there, it was full of people and people were all over the place and they didn't allow even the people that were sick to get in because the, the teachers of the law were in there, the, pre, like, the, the premium people of society. They were so there because they wanted to catch Jesus talking about this scandalous grace that we live. And they were so impetuous to catch him red-handed that they will fill the rooms and fill the places because they were about their arguments, but they were not about Jesus. Talking about being in a place with Jesus, not getting touched by him. And there are these four friends that bring a friend that cannot walk since he was born, and they bring him and, you know, things happen, end up putting your friend through the roof. Don't ask me. I don't know if you have done that, but 
I put, I put friends through the roof at some point, but, but not friends through the roof. But difference, there's a difference, yeah, there's a classical difference on that. And we'll talk about it later if you want in private. But, but these friends were, were putting this man through the roof. They broke the roof and they lowered this man because you got to know who surrounds you. These men were so desperate to see their friend getting healed. And thank God that this man could not walk, but he had good taste on his friendships. What talking about a good friend, isn't it? And sometimes we, we befriend situations and atmospheres and even people. We befriend timings even. If you want me, I'm going to hit you straight up into your chest wherever you are. I'm going to hit you with something. Don't let me. You probably can say, God, I need this right now, and you will be saved and spared. We befriend the wrong things. And we surround ourselves with things that are not willing to put the same weight to sharpen us, to sharpen our countenance. Countenance, foot for thought. Footnote, I'm going to change that one in a minute. Footnote, what is our countenance? Is our first representation. We talked about the eyes giving up how we are. And we talked about how a good friend knows how we are just by looking at us. First glance, blah. I can see my son from here to the backbone. And he knows, I know when he's dodging. And he's like, but the same you with me and the same I with you. This is how life is. This is how we're built. Who are we surrounding ourselves so I go back from the branches to the trunk? Let's do that. Jesus is, is walking the disciples into the reality of their soul and how they're dealing with their emotions. Because he knows he, they're going to need it. In the world that we're living today, we're going to need a gospel that is not petty. That is not easily offended. That is not looking to justify itself. We are in need of living a gospel. A gospel living in us, I should say. That actually is not looking for excuses just to be us, but is surrounded by the fire and the power of God. And because we can love people like that, because we have been loved like that, it is a gospel that lives in us that spreads thin and thick, wide as it comes. A gospel that fills all situations with virtue, hope, faith, and the ability to proclaim who he is in the midst of what we don't understand. Are you with me? So this is the gospel that we need. And Jesus is trying at that moment to make the disciples like we are right now. Acquainted with what we are and how much we need. This is it. So if you go out right now, get acquainted with who you are and understand that he has the rest. That's the gospel that we celebrate, that we meet together, that we think about, that we, you know, proclaim. And not only proclaim, that we study and that, that we shove on one another, you know, realities and say, but remember that you cannot forget that that's how he is. And remember when you had that situation, that's how he was. So he's not one that changes. He's unchangeable. He's immutable. He's never changing. That's your God. And we talk to one another on that level. Surround yourself with people that talk to you on that level. Because if not, life would serve you situations or lemons. It depends on how you're looking at it. Is there in Pisteres or the Bible? And... Um, and you will need instructions for that lemonade. You will need instructions to make it next day. And not to think that you are the source. You're just a resource that has seen, that lives, that proclaims the source. So we have Jesus. And he essentially is telling us how to love because the absence of sin is love. I just don't sin because I love God. I don't sin against you guys because I love you. At the moment I sin against you, I have to understand that I didn't love you how you needed. The way that we understand each other, that means love. The more I treat with one another and I share who is actually walking with me, that's Jesus and God is love. We are able to explain it different and better and deeper and more complete. So it makes us think. It makes us think of what I don't have and what he could do. So iron sharpens iron. And 
a man sharpens the countenance of their friend. Types of irony. In a house, we have different versions of what is valuable and what is not. 2 Timothy 2.20 says, in the Berean version, you don't have that in the screen, so I'm, you can listen to me. It says, verse 19, 219, let's go. And it says, nevertheless, God, firms, God firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord must turn away from iniquity, from doing what is not loving, essentially. It's a big word for that. But verse 20 says, a large house like yours, like your apartment, like your flat, like your mate's flat, like your cousin's flat, like, I don't know, like your backpack. A large house or a large backpack contains many, contains not only vessels of gold and silver, not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are from Ikea. I added that. Don't worry about it. Some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. So if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit, unfit, I love that he didn't call it sinful. What is unfit? Fit for our calling, fit for our faith, fit for who is inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. There's things that are not fit for that context. Are we with? Are we tracking like Eric would say? We're tracking. So there are things that are not fit. And there's in every house utensils of honor or of common use. I think the gospel for us has to become that. A revelation of the things in our life that are mixed with things that are not fit. Fit for our calling, fit for our reality, fit for the season, fit for the character of Christ, fit with the revelation that we already have attained with God. And there are things that we have to stop doing. We have to build that edge. When you are burning in a furnace, a piece of iron, preparing it to be a knife, you are burning a piece of steel with a purpose. The hotter the furnace, the sharper the knife will stay along its service because it was fit for service. The gospel in us, the character of Christ in us had, has to be fit for the times that we're living. And if we are easily offended, our knife will go bold and unfit for the season that we're living. But if God is among us and if he is talking his character into our being, if he's transforming the relationship that we have with our feelings and our actions, if he's actually pairing those two into a bold or into a sharp knife, we are the ones that say. We are the ones that put a stop. Some of us will stop at a common heat. Some of us will say, no, no, enough, Lord. I mean, I'm, I mean, I believe in you, you know. But you know what? I, I'm quite comfortable being common. And I know that offends you, and you will never say it publicly, but in the toilet. You will look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, I don't want to pay that price. Or maybe when you are understanding that you will have to sacrifice some of your luxuries for the need of your brother. Maybe, maybe. That's the maybe. I know that's not only my cousin, that's me and my house, but that's not you. We are all tempted to stay being common, having a common relationship with God, a common gospel understanding, a common church attendance, a common, common life walk, a common. But the Lord is saying, I am with you. And I want you to be more than common. I want you to be in utensil, fit for your calling. The Lord has called all of us to be assets into our community, into our friendships, into our families, into the world that we live in. He has called us to be that that brings value, not only resources, that that brings worth. 
Not only things, because there's a lot of parents that give things to their kids, but don't add any value to their lives. So we sometimes have been taught that gender of Christianity, that if God gives us, he loves us. But God wants to take us deeper into a more relationship with a bigger and more complete relationship with him. He wants to say, even beyond what I give you, and even if I don't give you, I can give you depth. I can give you understanding of my character. Are you with me? You tracking? I'm really trying, yeah. And I know I'm hitting you really hard right now. I know. I know. I got hit by God all week, so don't worry about it. You're not alone in the boat. You know what I mean? It is what it is. And if we're honest in our hearts, all of us are in that furnace, and we choose when we get out. But I know if God is bringing this word, it's because he doesn't want us to, you know, uh, crave so much that cooling moment of our lives that we forget that the more we're able to stay near to him, the more he will have to heat us up so our blade, so our edge stays sharp beyond specific situations. Have you seen, and maybe that's just me or some of the lads maybe have just opened some videos, you know, that just kind of plagued your Facebook or your Instagram where you, we have people that nowadays are doing some sexy, very sexy knives. And, and those knives, you know, I was taught, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't know if you expected that, but it is what it is. You judge me, you need salvation, you're right there. <laughs> and there's some knives that you say, that goes against nature. This person is like frying an onion on the knife. And I know if you put a knife on fire, it makes it bold. If you put it in the dishwasher, it makes it bold. Imagine. So I'm looking at these videos and I say, it can't be. But when you go into the chemistry of such a knife or such a piece of metal, they have an alloy. They have been mixed with the right thing in the right temperature in the right moment. And they have been taken out and taken care of. They have been sharpened, not with a stone. They have been sharpened in the right direction. And we can go into that. If you get me, we'll start a really long conversation. Two Christmases ago, I asked my wife for a, a knife sharpener. That's how boring I am. What do you want for Christmas? A knife sharpener. And I found this thing that had like the possibility of actually holding your cell phone in a specific way. And you had to download this app and it will tell you the kind of like the angle that, and how many degrees and all that kind of stuff. And I never used it. <laughs> but it had stones for the different types of alloys. I'm just going to talk about that because I didn't use the thing, you know. I mean, I even lent it to someone and they gave it back. I don't know if they used it, but I just, you know, like, I failed on using it. But if I am sharpening myself in the wrong direction or with the wrong people, I will have that type of edge. I know you didn't expect that one, but it's okay. What is sharpening you? You say, well, you know, they're not sinning. But are they expecting of God? Are they living to be a breathing fire of holiness around the people where they're living? Because that's what you're going to become. Proverbs also says, not only sharpen your brother, you know, in his countenance. It also says, surround yourself with those and I'll tell you who you are. So, who surrounds you has a lot to do and a big impact on how you live your relationship with God. And how you understand these things. So, I know all these things are very boring. And none of this applies to you. But the most important thing I want us to, and I really think that the Holy Spirit is pressing on us, that he does and he says all these things because he loves us. He doesn't want us to live limited to the potential of what we could be. And he's not scared of putting us in the furnace as many times as we need. Heating us up, you know, banging away the flakes of that alloy that was not the right thing in that season he just bangs it away so you are a stronger produce so he can use you for a stronger purpose a purpose of honor like timothy would say love actually makes us walk in our destiny it might you you might take notes right now just bring out your phone and i don't know what you had open before but ignore it and just go straight to notes right there the pad and he says you know what God wants us to sharpen our brother, or better said, we need to allow others to sharpen us so we can reach our destiny. 
And that means we have to keep on moving. The people that are the right people to surround us are those that push us towards the destiny of God in our life. That means the actions, you know, the actual moments and decisions that we all have inside of us planned for us. So God allows those people to love us so we reach that destiny, that specific end, and we don't become stagnant. Second, second out of seven, don't worry about it. Not 28 like that happened. I got like 14 only, but I was going to give you seven. Love actually and being sharpened by a brother or a sister in faith actually leads us into abundance. It will lead us into abundance of joy, but also will confront the abundance of sorrows that sometimes we don't know we have inside of us. And you will say, I don't have sorrows. But what if we are in a room of 50 people and 49 people turn around and never say hi? Do you have a sorrow? All of us had a, a degree of rejection, of not knowing how valuable we are, so we are expecting that the others will give us a resemblance, a reaction out of our presence there. So that means they'll tell me how valuable I am in that space. That's true of everyone in this room because we have been built by God to be loved. Surround yourself with the type of people that not only are going to have you and are happy to have you in their surroundings, but the ones that are going to give you something of his character. I don't care if you have two people only. Those are the right people for the season then. Those are pushing you to understand Jesus and his presence and his character a deeper way. Is this helping you? I mean, I feel like I'm alone. I know you are getting some. I feel like you're pulling out of it. But I know that we have to respond to make this happen. It is not enough for us to know it's true. It's how we react to the truth. We know that God is in this place. But it's how we react to his presence that creates in us. An experience with his spirit. Third, that love, that type of love inhabits us in the shape of grace. Grace in the sense of power and grace in the sense of position. Grace is a position, is the way I stand in front of things in life. You know what? I have this situation, but you know what? I have the grace of God. I take a position of power. I take a position. It might not be what I think. It might not be what I'm feeling, but it's, it's a position. You know what? I might have committed that mistake, but I stand in grace. That's my position. And I am able to recap and not do it again because I'm standing in grace. So grace is a position and grace also is power to stay in that position. Because I don't want to have hiccups of glory. I want to stand and I want to live in grace. That's the aim as we mature. That we have less times outside of that little carousel of life. We don't want to see the people having fun. We want to be part of the fun. We want to bring that fun to someone. We want to bring that power. But I don't know why you're so happy all the time. I mean, I can see you're human, but God, I've seen you sick. And you always have that face. What is it? I live in grace. And everything, everything has to submit to my position. I've been positioned in him and his grace. Are you with me? Fourth, is it helping you yet? Fourth, your calling. Love allows you and being sharpened by your brother, by your sister, allows you not only to find, but it defines your calling. So many of us actually find a little hint of what God wants us to do. The world is like, I have this feeling about, you know, what I like to do. And sometimes they never get to get close to the God that gave them that feeling that gave them that inclination in their thought life. But as Christians, our portion is to be able to be not only having a calling, but be narrowed down through people, through their experiences. God doesn't want us to live this by ourselves. No man is an island, they would say, in my little island. And that's the truth. That doesn't shy away from the gospel. Where are we standing? 
Are we living our calling because that love and being sharpened in truth, in relationship, keeps us walking, discovering, and it defines our calling. Fifth, it allows us to confess with our mouth, like Proverbs 18, 21, that the power of life and death, it is in our mouth, would say. It allows us love that way, sharpening that way, that kind of experience, that kind of gospel, that kind of relationships around me, that kind of surround me will never allow me to fall out from being called and to confess it. Some people have a bad understanding of that word confession. We think that's in the corner, lighting a candle, or saying to someone behind the shade what I am ashamed of. But confession in its truest form is actually understanding what God says about me and me employing my mouth about it. God said, so I can. If you confess your sin, that was not the point of you having a mouth. That was not the original plan. You can use it for that. You can confess your sin. But the original plan of confession was to declare what God is saying. So you can align with it. Let's come out of this. I don't know where the line is. Let me see if this is, this is a sin or not. I don't know if I'm loved. You know what? We are loved. Either we know it or we don't. That's the bottom line. God created us with purpose. And as we found Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, we're loved not only in the natural, but in the supernatural. We will have eternal life. And that's what the Bible preaches. And we have as salvation, as a gift. And from there, we don't have to be moved. But this empowers us to walk in our calling. As we confess, we walk it. Is this helping you? Have you felt sometimes this week powerless on the walk that you have with Christ? I have. I don't know you. And I think if we're honest, this week, all of us at some point said, for real? I mean, am I the guy? You are sure you didn't get the wrong postcode? Like, you know, you know that I, when, it, when then they do, when they try to sharpen me like that, you know, you know how I get offended, mate, you know? I don't know that doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me and Lola sometimes. <laughs> Just going to leave it there. I'm trying to close, you know. <laughs> we have to keep on moving. We have to keep on walking. This is not a stagnant faith. And when we are getting sharpened, this is a process that provokes, that is pro progressive, not in the way that the world wants to describe progressive, taking around what God said to what I feel and make it a truth-ish. God calls us and his love is on the move. The last two, love and being sharper makes me receptive to hear and to capture. To hear and to capture. I'm able to hear from God. I'm able to capture the essence of what he says. Some of us would say, God said, but we don't capture the essence of what he's saying. So we do a wrong thing with the right motivation. So as Christians, we are not like those that are to be lost. We are like those that are able to capture also. Not information, but the revelation. We capture the revelation. We hear the information. God said but how do I do it? Sometimes we run. I used to have this thing with Gimel. Gimel is my oldest son and he doesn't do this anymore. Ish. I used to say, Gimel, can you go and, and Gimel? We used to live in a three-story house. And Gimel will go down the stairs and you will hear his little flapping like of feet. And before I ended it saying what I wanted from downstairs, he was on his way. But because I knew what I just had not said to him, I was just waiting for that stop, awkward stop. So I will hear. And that silence meant uh, he didn't know what I wanted. Yeah. And I just could think about Gimel thinking, what did he say? <laughs> and because I knew I had not said it, or I have not given him revelation, 
I had given him a direction, but not the insight. Gimel would stay there, stuck. And he didn't want to disappoint, so he was there really, like, really thinking, thinking really hard. You know when you can hear the bearings on their brain, you know? <laughs> and you can hear the desperation of, like, come on, come on, come on, come on. What was it? What was it? What was it? And sometimes we find ourselves in our faith, in our walk with God, with direction and no insight. But this message is to give us hope that you're not alone, that this happens to all of us because we're broken people serving an unbreakable God, an unbreakable love, an unbreakable presence that fills us day in and day out with direction and revelation. And we don't have to suffice because he's more than enough. And this is what Jesus is saying, hey, you will have to forgive. And they facing their situation said, give us faith. The Bible says that only God can give us faith. There's human faith. It's called goodwill, good thoughts. That doesn't work. But then there's the faith that give, is given by God that says, even though you said, and I believe you, Lord. Because we're judging it by his character. You don't believe me? Ask David. The same guy that committed mistakes. He himself was in front of an army that he shouldn't be in front of. And with this, we close. And David was able to see the situation through the eyes of a revelation that he had received by having a relationship. David had been in front of things that could have taken from him what everyone was fearing losing. That was their lives. But David saw that in that moment, God had come through. All of us have experiences with God. I'm not going to say the story because sometimes we're negligent and we take it all the way to the situation that we're talking about. But all of us have situationships. Situation situationships. That's the that end. <laughs> That's uh, that Puerto Rican easy right there. All of us have situations that actually will prove this completely right. And if we're honest, all of us need revelation. All of us are getting bladed and sharpened by our brother, by our sister, if we have surrounded ourselves with those. Let's not lose time with being offended by those that say, in this area, come on, you can do better. In this area, have you seen God? In this area, I don't know if that's okay. In this area... Let's not be offended. Let's not join in with the narrative that the world has. Let's live a gospel that is alive, that is powerful, that is complete, that completes us, that doesn't demand from us, but adds into us what is needed for the task that he has given us. A gospel that reveals itself day in and day out fresh and is not stagnant. A gospel that keeps us in the move. A gospel that keeps us walking through the steps that he's designed for each one of us. A gospel that understands us and our feelings and our proclivities. Day in and day out, as far as the east is from the west, takes everything that is awkward in us. That doesn't allow us to walk on those things and makes it right. A gospel that when we come with humility and say, give us faith. Or, Father, you know I have done wrong. Or, you know what, I cannot do that if you don't pop it in the story. A gospel that says, I am, I am that I am. A gospel that is alive, that is not religion, that brings faith and truth into one thing and calls it love, that actually sees you with the eyes that no one else will be able to see you, the eyes that see eternity in your heart before you had one beat on your heart. This is the gospel that we live this is the Christ that lives in each one of us. This is the resurrection and this is the part and this is the process that we're in. All of us are getting sharpened, but Christ is already in us. And he leads us into salvation and he leads us into still waters and he leads us into furnaces and situations that try it out, but never will be able to take from us but the flakes, because he is purifying us. This is the gospel that today God is wanting to convey. That's the portion of this message. That's the power that he wants us to live with. That's the urgency of heaven, that we are living in days that we cannot be easily offended because God sees us and we are not petty. We are not weak in our emotions. God strengthens our emotions. He strengthens our minds. He strengthens our surroundings by friends. And if we are not enough, he's there. 
That's what we preach. We preach power for the ones that don't have it. We preach Christ and salvation and miracles when we are not enough and everything is broken. We know that he can jump in. We know he can suffice. We understand that the blood that has been in him and has been poured for each one of us. And that resurrection is more than enough. And we don't have to be afraid. And we don't have to be offended. And we can deal with our emotions in our primary colors, I call it. You know, when you're sad and when you're happy, primary colors. When you're angry, secondary colors. That means you have tried to add into your alloy your own strength. Let's not add our own color to the mix. Let's just go in the primary colors of life. I am sad and I don't know what to do with it. I might be offended and I don't know. But I want to forgive. I want to be sharpened. I want that gospel to live in me. I want that power that resurrected you to resurrect in me this situation. I want to be not a victim. I want to be victorious like you called it to be. I am because you are. I believe the Lord has been talking to us. I believe that the Lord has come with gentle hands, picked up a couple of things, used a, a broken vase to convey an unbreakable truth because he wants us to be sharp. He wants us to be uncommon, uncommon for our generation, uncommon for our surroundings, uncommon for our neighborhoods, for our mates, even inside of our families, uncommon. There's nothing common about who lives in you. And he wants you to live there. If God has been speaking to you, joining your feet, if he hasn't, please don't take a break. But I believe that as we stand, we're taking a stand on who he is. And everything that he has made available to us. As we stand, we're saying, God, I want you to sharpen me. And I don't want you to have a hold. I don't want me to be that in between being common and uncommon. I don't want the people to suffer my limitations. I don't want to take from the daily lives of people my laughter and the wisdom, my brokenness, and what I have learned through it from your character. I don't want to be that one. I want to be that one that is able to boast on his own brokenness. I want to be that one that says, you know what, I haven't been. But you know what, what I'm learning, that even when I'm not, he is. He's strong. He's always abounding. He is. God never called his people to be perfect, face-masked people. Photoshopped relationships with God. Pinterest expectations. He wants us to be sharpened, to be loved, to be set free. If that's you and you want to be sharpened, do know <laughs> this is going to be a furnace, eh? But hey, after the furnace, the in and the out, he flakes out, he bubbles out, he sharpens you into brightness. And from brightness to brightness, and from glory to glory, into situations that have you met him better, into situations that you portray him better. God with us, our hope of glory. So I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for not leading us into temptation. Thank you, Lord, for surrounding us with a witness, like Hebrew would say, with a cloud of witnesses that can see how you are at work that are able to celebrate, Lord, with us, your presence manifested through our lives, Lord, around us. Call it friends, family, angels. Father, call it whatever. But Father, give us today our daily bread. Put us in the furnace, Lord. Heat us up. Take 
all that flakiness of our faith, Lord, that bubbles up to nothing and leads us into situations and feelings and offense. Lead us into who you are. Lead us into being uncommon and sharpened for any task that you put in front of us, Lord. Lead us today. And may you take all the glory, Lord. Father, lead us into thought patterns that no one in our family was able to capture because they stopped looking at you. Father, lead us into mental health. Lead us into patterns in our finances, in our emotions, Lord, that lead people to know that if it wasn't for you, we would not be able to make it. Father, lead us into the miraculous, into the ridiculous sometimes. Lead us into what everyone will have to say if it wasn't God, we don't know. It has to be God. Father, you have shaped us. You have decided for us. You have already called us and destined us to walk on steps that we don't see around us reflected. So it means they are not common. But Father, we need your power. We need your wisdom. We need your insight. Father, we need you to heal us and to use us as balm and healing for others. Father, we need you. And without you, there's nothing. Lord, as a congregation, as part of your church, Around the world, we ask that you will unleash this anointing. That you will unleash this grace, this power. This grace that keeps us fresh when everything is becoming dull. That keeps us sharp when everything has lost its destiny, its flavor. To give us a saltiness that produces miracles. And a new beginning for many. Lead us today. Lead us today. If there's anyone in this room who today has not made already a decision to accept Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't know what these people are talking about, but if it's it, I want you in my heart. If you have not decided to say, Jesus, I want to follow you. If you have not made him the Lord of your life, if your name is not written in eternity, and you have no assurance of this, but you want it, and you are in this place, walk no more, think no more, be still. You can say, God, today, you and me, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Be my new beginning. Lead me on. And I will follow. If you're in this place, someone brought you, and God has been moving something inside. Every head bow, every eye shut. You can lift your arm. Jesus is in this room. He sees you. He's the God that sees you. He's the God that knows. He's the God that shelters you because he knows you. Some others will be wondering about your actions, but God sees your heart and he knows. He loves you. He's full of grace, even more of truth. He's completely righteous and overwhelmed by a love that will shelter you and clean you. And pick you up from any place you have fallen to. He's Jesus. He's Jesus. For anyone in this room who has been a bit dry, has not been able to be comforted, has not been able to understand what God might be saying, but today you have met with Him. You have had that hit in your spirit, your heart has gone into motions. You had your chest palpitating. You had your mind going in every direction. You had hope in storing your bones again. If that's you, 
lift up your arm. Jesus, your glory. Jesus. 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 Father, every heart in here, every person in this room, Lord, I just felt, Lord, that you have talked to them. Father, I ask that your grace will be more, more than obvious, Lord, this week. That your power, your authority to walk in that forgiveness, in that revelation. Father, will walk into everything in their lives. That they will have no doubts. Father, and even in the face of doubts, they will say, Father, we need faith. Father, I pray for every sickness in this room. Father, we believe that you're the father of healing. You are the doctor by excellence. You heal our hearts, and beyond our hearts, you heal our minds. And beyond our minds, our bodies align with what you say. Father, in this moment, I pray for every disease, every emotional need that is trapped in our minds, every need, every mo emotional and mental health issue, Lord. Every depression, every spirit of death, Lord, I pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord, let your healing flow, Father, as we sing, as we proclaim your name. Father, as we walk in the room, Father, I ask for your river to flow. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.